I will be actually talking through a PowerPoint, as you can see, because we're going to be looking at a lot of the research. Um, I, uh, because uh, the D3 that uh, we're going to be talking about today involves um, uh, things that supplement companies are, are not allowed to speak to, um, uh, one, I will be giving a disclaimer at the beginning. And then two, I will be mostly reading directly from the research. Um, so this is for informational purposes only. So um, let's get to the disclaimer. So this video is intended for informational use only. I am very passionate about reading the studies and the research out there, but a lot of people aren't. And I want to make some of this information uh, user-friendly for people to understand um, what the research community is discovering, uh, both about our physiology and nutrition as a whole, and, um, and then uh, take a look at... Sorry, just a second. Uh, then uh, take a look at uh, it deeper and further and then have some conversation about it. So I am not a practitioner. This presentation is for informational use only. Nothing in this presentation is intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All information presented here is not meant as a substitute or alternative to information from healthcare practitioners please consult with your physician. This information uh, presented is from studies available online. All citations and links to the studies, articles, and presentations will be posted on the slides and in the comment sections for you to review for yourself and with your healthcare providers. So um, D3 and immune health. So D3 is important for a lot of functions in the body from bone health to testosterone, healthy testosterone and optimal testosterone levels um, to appropriate recovery and also immune health. Now D3's association with immune health is relatively new as far as research goes. And we've been discovering a lot about how important D3 is for overall immune health and proper immune function. So what I am going to be talking about is D3's specific application to a uh, immunopeptide called cathelicidin. In this presentation, I will discuss the importance of immunonutrition, which is um, how our specific nutrition affects our immune system and consistent correlation throughout age, gender, race, body weight, locality, and season, suggesting a relationship between levels of D3 and butyrate from plant fiber to cathelicidin. So this is a picture of how D3 actually uh, is, is made in a very simple uh, one, two, three step. Uh, that sun activates um, a form, a precursor of D3 in our body, is taken to our liver where it's converted. And then finally, it is converted to the one, two, five um, dihydroxy uh, uh, D3 formula that is the active form of vitamin D3, and then it's used in our bodies. Now, for activation, uh, D3 can actually be taken to other different cells because there are direct active activation properties of D3 as well to immune cells like B cells and T cells, beta cells and T cells. Um, and we're going to look at a, a little bit of that, but mostly what I'm going to fo focus on is the indirect relationship of vitamin D3 to cathelicidin. So again, lots of uh, direct and indirect um, uh, vitamin D3 has been well established to have both direct and indirect uh, effects on our immune function. So as you can see right here in this diagram, you can see um, uh, vitamin D, it's 25-OHD at the top left-hand corner of the uh, cell, uh, coming into the cell. Now it can be um, activated and taken to uh, T cells and B cells, which are both immune cells that function to help 
uh, combat uh, pathogens, or it can be, as you can see, converted to 1,2,5-OH-D uh, and then form cathelicidin, which you can see as it passes the nucleus and forms cathelicidin on the right-hand side of your screen, which is used by our body to um, kill bacteria, viruses, and other functions. So cathelicidins, what are cathelicidins? Well, there's a lot of different cathelicidins in the animal kingdom. Uh, human beings only have one called LL37. Cathelicidin uh, exhibits a wide range of immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory activities. Um, again, these are direct quotes from the studies. I am not, these are not me talking. These are just direct quotes that I'm reading you from the studies. Everything you see in parentheses is a direct quote from the study, um, where the study references something like it or a, a word that describes something already previously described. I will put that in parentheses so that you know what they're talking about for communication purposes. Everything else outside of the parentheses are direct quotes from the studies. And also, you will also see the links to the actual studies so you can verify and validate them for yourself. So what are cathelicidins? Cathelicidins are uh, immunopeptides that are created by the human body to help combat uh, pathogens. Um, so let's get into the descriptors a little more. Um, so cathelicidin, again, LL37, you'll see that because that's the specific cathelicidin in human beings. Um, and I'll read this too. Uh, this review focused on the activity of human host defense peptides. You'll see it called human host defense peptide or um, HDP, host defense peptide. Um, so including alpha and beta defensins and the sole human cathelicidin, LL37, against both enveloped, and this is in parentheses because I want you to know that COVID-19 is an enveloped um, uh, form of virus and non-enveloped viruses. The broad spectrum of antiviral activity of these peptides both in vitro and in vivo, that is in cell cultures and in uh, living beings, suggests that they play an important role in the innate vir antiviral defense against viral infections. So our um, immune system has two forms, innate and um, a slower form of viral uh, of response, which handles just like stress and, and stuff that don't need an immediate response. Innate is, requires an immediate response. Um, and, and so that's what we're gonna focus on is the innate response. So what does cathelicidin do in the body? Now, remember when we're talking about the relationship to D3 and how it affects cathelicidin, it upregulates cathelicidin. But cathelicidin is actually one of the peptides that the body uses and the body uh, makes other ones too, like defensins, that the body uses to actually control, uh, protect against, and even destroy uh, viruses. So, uh, the vitamin D does not have direct activity, although vitamin D does have beneficial direct activities. I'm not gonna be talking about that here, um, but you can definitely find out more information about how vitamin D actually directly, more directly helps with other things um, when we're talking about pathogenic uh, infections and inflammation. <clears throat> According to the studies, and we'll go e over each one of these claims as stated in the studies, a, it's protective, and I'm just summarizing it here on this screen for you, but we'll, we'll highlight it in each one of the studies. Protective, it's protective against viral infections by inhibiting cell binding. So by now you've all seen the pictures of the virus on television and on, on your uh, internet connections. <laughs> And you see those little spiky things sticking out of it. And those are uh, spike proteins that the um, virus uses to bind to our human cells. And um, cathelicidin has a protective effect by inhibiting those spikes from actually docking to human cells. So that's very important. And then B, it decreases infection. So it actually can um, increase cell stiffness 
and decrease the cell permeability, making it harder for the virus to penetrate and um, do its damage. In, uh, specifically in the lungs, so the epithelial cells in the lung, this uh, cells lining the lung, uh, the esophagus, and even the nasal uh, membranes, in, um, in, and, it, and in doing so, decreases cell infection. Uh, C, it has direct effects. Uh, Cathelicidin binds directly to the physical virus. So there are other ways to kill the uh, virus called apoptosis, which is taking an infected cell and just destroying the whole human cell. But this actually binds directly to the virus itself to try to prevent it from harming the cell to begin with. An ounce of prevention for sure is much better. Um, uh, and the fourth one, D, it reduces the growth and spread. It inhibits the virus replication. And very interesting method for uh, inhibiting the viral um, replication, but I will leave you to read the studies to uh, further explore how that does that because the process is a bit complicated and requires kind of messing with the uh, virus's ability to reproduce proteins uh, and therefore not be able to reproduce its viruses. Reducing inflammation, over-inflammation, cytokine storm. So a lot of people, um, I shouldn't say a lot of people, there are people who are dying um, uh, from symptoms caused by the virus uh, indirectly. So our body in response can release cytokines. And when we overproduce cytokines, it, it produces an inflammatory state that can cause our lungs to fill with fluid, um, basically causing uh, the person to cut off oxygen supply and, and asphyxiate. So we want to um, make sure that the body wants to make sure rather through its production of all of its immune system to make sure that there are anti-inflammatory mechanisms at play uh, as well as the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it reduces over-inflammation, is anti-inflammatory, and reduces cytokine overproduction. And next, it destroys the virus. It actually breaks down the viral membrane. And I'm going to show you a picture of that in action in just a moment. And then it's pre and post. So it has direct antiviral activity, both prior and after cell infection. So it's good for helping prevent it, and then it's good for destroying it once, once or if you do get infected. So this is the pictures of, uh, actual pictures of cathelicidin um, you being utilized to destroy uh, viral membranes. On the top three slides, which is slide A, which is the top three slides, you can see the little black arrows there showing membrane integrity. You can see the line, the membrane of the whole viral cell in perfect intact position. Now, you look at slide B, the bottom three slides, and you can see uh, the white arrows showing where cathelicidin has destroyed disintegrated the membrane, dissolved the membrane um, of the uh, virus. And you can see the long black arrows where the guts, so to speak, of the virus are spilling out into space, basically showing the death of the virus. It's not death because viruses technically aren't alive, um, but the destruction of the virus. So that is actually uh, your body at work. You know, people ask, how do I get better? Well, this is how your body gets better. Um, it uses these peptides and not only cathelicide. Look, there's a whole host of different mechanisms our body uses um, to do it. What I'm talking about is just cathelicide because it has a direct relationship uh, with vitamin D3 and why that's important. Okay, so there. this is another diagram showing there are actually six different methods in which cathelicidin has effects on the virus. So um, the six different effects of the viruses are direct binding and damaging to the viral envelope. So there are two types of viruses, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And this is important because coronaviruses are the current virus that's out now, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is a uh, enveloped virus. Uh, it is actually, uh, the cathelicidin is directly binding to that and damaging the 
envelope which protects the virus and uh, from being further damaged. And then in, in cell two, you can see it inhibits the binding by the virus to the human cells. So this makes, even if you have the virus coming into your body, um, cathelicidin, when it's most effective, can actually inhibit the cell, the virus from binding to our healthy cells. Third, modulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. Remember the cytokine storms that I just talked about. This uh, cathelicidin actually helps modulate that so it doesn't overproduce and cause even more damage from pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then four, what I talked about just recently, disrupting the virus protein production. By disrupting the virus's ability to produce proteins, just like us, we can't produce a baby <laughs> without producing proteins to create that baby. Well, the virus does the same thing. In order to reproduce, uh, which is repopulate or spread or increase the number of viruses, it needs to produce proteins to create new viruses and the cathelicidin actually interferes with that process, disrupting the process and making sure that the virus doesn't continue to repopulate. Really important piece there. And then finally, uh, cath cathelicidin uh, destroys the outer membrane, killing the virus. And then lastly, it uh, innate immune signaling. So it actually signals other parts of the immune system to come in and assist with the control and destruction of the uh, virus. So let's look at what happens in the lungs because coronavirus attacks the lungs specifically. Um, a great uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Ryan Rail. I strongly suggest you watch it from beginning to end. It was very inspiring for me. It really inspired me on this path of looking more into it. Um, his uh, uh, One of his slides is up on the screen on the right-hand side, and you can see the reference directly below the slide. So in another study, it showed vitamin D supplementation to prevent acute respiratory tract infections, systematic review of meta-analysis, of individual participant data. So meta-analysis is looking at a lot of different studies and seeing if we see a consistent pattern or an overall view that could tell us, hey, yeah, this is probably pretty valid because we're seeing the same thing reproduced in multiple studies. So this one, this uh, meta-analysis took 25 eligible randomized, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, from ages zero to 95, and uh, with over 11,000 people in the studies, um, vitamin D supplementation reduced the risk of acute respiratory tract infection among all participants. Now that's pretty powerful because usually you don't get that kind of statement in a study, especially a meta-analysis. Usually there's some fluctuation in the data, but this shows is very consistent throughout 25 eligible RCTs or randomized controlled trials. So this uh, uh, picture on the right will show you three sets. So the bottom set of three is with uh, an infected uh, bronchial. These are the airway passages in the lungs. And the top set of three are healthy uh, bronchial passageways. So you see the top three are all open, nice and fairly round, and that's healthy bronchioles. Um, in vitamin, the first set above and below is vitamin D deficient. So if you look at the bottom set with a vitamin D deficient, you can see once the virus is infected, um, it is closing the bronchioles. And that's where people get the cough, feel like they can't breathe because they're not getting as much oxygen in. When you see the next set of cells, the middle set of images on the top is vitamin D sufficient in a healthy person and then one who has been infected. So you see vitamin D sufficient and the bronchioles are open much better, but you still see the inflammation, the thickness of the walls there, and you can see a lot of inflammation. Now with vitamin D supplementation, you can see the change. You can see where the bottom cell, even though it's affected, is now wide open and much less inflammation. And you can see the body in a much healthier state with vitamin D supplementation. 
So that's a pretty impressive pictures. And again, I encourage you uh, to read uh, Dr. Rell's um, and watch his video. Uh, I thought I thought it was very impressive, and I think you'd probably get some good information out of there too as well. I'll be citing that um, presentation several times. He did some really nice research on this. Next is um, so. What are the protective effects? And again, all of these are quotes directly verbatim from studies and the links are right below. So everything you see in um, parentheses, uh, in um, yeah, parentheses is, is directly from the quote cited below. Cathelcidin is noted to increase cell stiffness and decrease cell permeability in the lung epithelium. These are the cells that line just like your epithelial cells or your skin. It's the skin uh, a layer basically of the lungs resulting in decreased cell infection. Really important. Um, so upregulating that cathelcidin could mean much more protection to the lungs and possibly, um, well, I won't say anything. I'll let the study speak for themselves. <laughs> I'll let you connect the dots. What, so, okay, so cathelcidin is pretty amazing. Uh, you can see by all that research um, from multiple different sources um, that it has a pretty impressive effect on how, what our body uses to do, uh, to keep uh, viral and bacterial um, as well, uh, pathogens under control. Uh, this is how our body fights off, uh, one way our body fights off virus infections, especially in uh, the lungs. So what is it that actually helps our body produce uh, and activate cathelicidin? So what upregulates and increases the effects of cathelicidin? So vitamin D3 induces and upregulates cathelicidin. Now that's the actual name of this piece. So the study's name is Epidemic Influenza and Vitamin D. And the quote is, perhaps most importantly, vitamin D, because it just referenced it in a pronoun, dramatically stimulates the expression of potent antimicrobial peptides. Antimicrobial peptides, cathelicidin is one of them. Uh, because when cathelicidin was first uh, identified, uh, they only understood it, well, I shouldn't say that. It was understood by some to be only antimicrobial. Now, much of the research is focusing on its antiviral activity as well. Okay, so let me read again. Perhaps most importantly, vitamin D dramatically stimulates the expression of potent antimicrobial peptides like cathelicidin, which exist in neutro, uh, neutrophils, uh, monocytes, NK cells, natural killer cells, and epithelial cells lining the respiratory tract, where they play a major role in protecting the lung from infection. Now, this is really important for um, what we're experiencing right now, which has a dramatic effect on the lungs. Um, again, all of these research will be summarized and posted in the comments section, so you can directly click on the links and uh, follow them yourself. So further uh, research shows antiviral potential of cathelicidin. That is the name of the study. Um, and this is the quote from it. Recent studies have also demonstrated the importance of 1,2,5-dihydroxy vitamin D3 activity on camp gene promoter and implicated role of parathyroid hormone in the regulation of this cathelicidin. In, a, in addition, research has identified compounds such as butyrate as having therapeutic potential as inducers of cathelicidin expression. Okay, so what is butyrate? Butyrates are produced when our body, when we consume fiber, our probiotic bacteria, our gut microbiome digests that fiber and it's one of its end products, one of the things that's created when it breaks down and metabolizes the fiber are things called butyrates. 
we're realizing now how important butyrates are to immune function, as well as a host of other benefits, health benefits in our cells. For that reason, I think we should redefine the macronutrients uh, to include fiber. So the three macronutrients now which are established and accepted are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. But I think fiber is equally important and it's a nutrient that we get in abundance like other macronutrients instead of micronutrients where we only need a small amount like vitamins and minerals. Fiber, we need a, a pretty decent amount in order to form these butyrates, which then have a, um, a, a direct effect on upregulating and inducing cathelicidin, which can help us with our immune system. Now, we look at our modern diets today, and we're really devoid with all the processed foods that we're eating. Um, we've ripped out the fiber in so much of the processed foods. That's why it's really important to get good sources of fiber, uh, your dark greens, um, all your leafy vegetables and beans, especially very high in fiber. So at the bottom, there's a little parenthesis. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid produced primarily by bacterial fermentation of fiber in the colon. So getting, uh, and I'll be talking about this in just a second, that butyrates, uh, combined with D3 have even a more powerful uh, synergistic relationship for helping us during these uh, these times. Okay, um, so this study shows the effect of vi vitamin D3 on antimicrobial peptide expression in uh, keratinocytes. So these are cells um, that are incubated with D3 induced upregulated expression of both beta defensin. Defensin is one of the other um, uh, peptides, immunopeptides that our body produces along with cathelicidin, uh, the specific human form, LL37, in a dose and time dependent matter. Conclusion, these results indicate that expression of beta defensin and cathelicidin may be upregulated by the stimulation of vitamin D3. So again, another study showing cathelicidins, a family of antimicrobial peptides, a review. Moreover, production of LL37 is stimulated by vitamin D. Another study, vitamin D and the antiviral state. Newer evidence suggests that vitamin D also plays a major role regulating the immune system, perhaps including immune responses to viral infection. Vitamin D has direct antiviral effects, particularly against enveloped viruses. Now, this study is talking about some of the direct effects of vitamin D3 rather than just the indirect effects of upregulating cathelicidin, which then has its direct effects on the virus. So there's two ways vitamin D3 can play a role in this, both direct effects um, and indirect effects. So the conclusion from this study says these results support the hypothesis that vitamin D3 induced LL37 or cathelicidin and to a lesser extent human beta defensin 2 may play a role, major role in the inhibition of viruses that's preventing them from doing their thing. So the next study is how much D3 upregulates uh, cathelicidin. So the next question again is, wow, this cathelicidin seems like what we should be helping. If this is what our body does, so uses to help uh, wipe out these viruses, help defend against infection, help, help uh, do that, this is what our body is producing. How can we help assist our body with that? And in this study, they show, um, this study is actually talking about um, cathelicidin upregulation in a bacterial infection, in this case, tuberculosis. And I'll read the title of the study to you. Oral intake of phenylbutyrate with or without vitamin D3 upregulates the cathelicidin in human macro macrophages. A dose 
finding study for treatment of tuberculosis. So the conclusion they came up with is about 500 milligrams of butyrate. Uh, they're using a specific uh, synthetically made butyrate, but um, in all intents and purposes, the butyrate uh, can be uh, gotten from uh, fiber. And then with uh, 5,000 IUs of, of vitamin D3, is, and they found that the optimal dose for induction or um, the increase of cathocytin LL37 in macrophages and lymphocytes and the intracellular killing by the macrophages. So um, there are immune cells like lymphocytes and macrophages and uh, neutrophils, and there's lots of different forms of these immune cells, and many of them use uh, cathocytin to help do their work in destroying the pathogens. So who might be low in vitamin D3? Um, well, there's an actual prevalence. Many researchers and doctors are saying it's an epidemic of vitamin D3 efficiency. And part of that reason is because of our modern society practices. Most of us are working indoors uh, five days a week um, and are not in direct sunlight. Um, so uh, there are other confounding factors, and I'm going to go over that uh, in just a second, but I'm going to start with um, northerners and seasonality. Um, so what we're looking at right now is seasonality. Sorry, I have the wrong quote from there in there, but I'm sure I'll go over it in the next slide. But this uh, prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, and then you can see Dr. Rail's um, slide here showing uh, vitamin D3 levels in human beings tested uh, where their vitamin D levels at were during the summer months, August. You can see it at that its peak at 32 nanograms per milliliter, and then it drops like a stone <laughs> to uh, uh, very low levels in January, February, and March before it starts to gradually decrease and reach its peak optimal levels during August. So when we're looking at, hey, why do viruses and colds, cold is a virus too as well, why why do they all show up in the wintertime? Well, and then this is just me in discussion, is do you ever ask yourself why they show up only in the wintertime? Well, they don't. You can actually get a cold or a virus any time of the year, but why they're more prevalent during this time is maybe because of this correlation because our vitamin D3 is low. If D3 upregulates cathelicidin and cathelicidin destroys the virus, it would make sense that as seasonality, we're not exposed to sunlight, our D3 levels drop, our cathelicidin levels may be also reduced, then our natural defense against these viruses is also reduced. And therefore, that's when we see the symptoms of the virus and not so much the actual uh, virus presence itself. So we may actually be picking up the virus early in the year, but because the lower vitamin D3 status leading to lower cathelicidin upregulation may mean we have just less defense during the winter months. And this is maybe why we see colds and flus usually happen in the winter. It is also uh, correlated directly with northerners. So an interesting effect, let me see if I've got it on the next slide. Nope, that's not the snake. All right, so in northern communities, so um, uh, researchers at Harvard University looked at the 35 to 37 uh, parallel, which is uh, a line, a parallel line of, of degree. Anything above that parallel line on uh, the map, so to speak, any states above that, any countries above that, any populations above that line, because of the curvature of the earth and the way the sunlight hits our atmosphere, um, could be getting little or even no uh, vitamin D3 conversion, um, even if you are getting direct sunlight. So those people living in the north, and you look at the northern environments, uh, the northern environments like China, like New York City, uh, high amounts of um, problems. And then you look at southern communities, which are getting full light, like India, which has very little incidence of the cold and flus 
happening right now. And you can see the difference um, and why that is very corollary. Uh, again, this is not defining it, it's not saying absolutely, it's saying here's a lot of information and there may be a direct correlation. And I'm going to continue with these correlation because it, it really starts to paint a pretty clear picture. Um, ethnicity. Now, uh, please do not misunderstand this. Um, I, I will explain the why in the second paragraph, but please hear me out before you make any judgments about this. Uh, blacks are um, suffering from, during this time, um, with a much higher frequency. And there are a lot of factors that go into that. But one contributing factor may be the D3. And here's why, and here I'll explain it. So this study, the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency and associated risk factors in the US population. Ethnicity, according to the data collected between 2005 and six, and there's more current data out there. This is the only one that I uh, could grab at the moment trying to put this PowerPoint together, but there's plenty of data out there showing the relationship between people with darker skin colors and their, um, their ability to convert vitamin D3. So the survey from NANAS um, shows insufficient vitamin D levels were found in 41% of the population sample size. That in itself is epidemic. Having 41% of our popu US population insufficient vitamin D levels is startling and it's cause for concern. Um, and remember those slides that show even during sufficient vitamin D level, there was more damage going on as opposed to optimal vitamin D level. So insufficient, sufficient, and optimal. And that's where we need to be, I believe, uh, can be very helpful to us during times where our body is challenged and may require higher levels of vitamin D. So race was identified as a significant factor with African-American adults having the highest prevalence rate of vitamin D deficiency. That's an 82% deficiency amongst African-Americans, followed by Hispanic adults with 62%, almost 63% deficiency in vitamin D3. So maybe even more important for Blacks and Hispanics, um, like my wife, I am, I am uh, joyfully married, to uh, then my wife, who is Hispanic from Puerto Rico, and uh, her requirements for vitamin D are about two to five times my personal requirements as a uh, white person. Um, and that, okay, so what is the reason for that? And I'll read it directly from the study. The established physiological mechanism by which non-Hispanic African-Americans and Mexican-Americans are predisposed to vitamin deficiency is the increased melanin levels found in the skin. The increased melanin absorbs and scatters ultraviolet rays from sunlight, which results in less efficient conversion to vitamin D3. So even if I were at the beach and a black person and a Hispanic person were at the beach, I would get a lot more D3 from that than they were even under the same amount of exposure to the sun. So normally those with darker skin, there's a good reason why they have darker skin because of the melanin. And the more you're exposed to sun, the more the body says, well, wait a minute, I'm getting too much exposure. I'll secrete more melanin and darken the skin. And therefore it will reduce the amount of exposure to the sun. This would be a good thing. But for those of us who are now living indoors, it's even more important, especially for blacks and Hispanics, to consider their get your vitamin D levels checked and talk with your doctor about appropriate ways to um, get yourself back into optimal states of vitamin D3. Remember, better states of vitamin D3 may be associated with the risk factors that uh, lead to lower cathelicidin levels and then uh, more aggressive actions of viruses because there's lower levels of cathelicidin. So overweight and obese people. So the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency associated with risk factors in the US population, again, quote, 
Additional risk factors for vitamin D deficiency uh, were identified included obesity. So the next study right below it is from the vitamin D deficiency in, iron, in Ireland, implications for COVID-19. Now they're looking right at COVID-19 and correlating it with vitamin D deficiency. So this is called the TILDA or the Irish uh, longitudinal study. Remember longitudinal because they're north of the equator making that light, even though they're getting sunlight exposure during the winter months, they may not be getting uh, little or any vitamin D3 conversion at all. And in that study, and here's a quote, of particular concern, we observed very high levels of vitamin D deficiency in those who are obese. Now, why is that even more concern? Uh, because vitamin D3 is fat soluble. It's a fat soluble vitamin, technically not a vitamin at all. It's a hormone, but for conversational purposes, we'll call it vitamin D because that's what most people refer to vitamin D as. And because it's a fat soluble vitamin, if you have a lot more fat, that vitamin D3 can be sucked up into the fat and then not be available for uh, functions unless the fat is broken down. So this can cause an issue. And when you look at the death rates of people in the hospitals, Blacks, uh, Hispanics, and people who are overweight are are a high percentage of those, and there's a direct correlation to their vitamin D levels as well. And then of course you say, yes, but the vast majority of those people are elderly. And that is also true. Well, let's take a look at the elderly with vitamin D3 levels. And this again is a direct quote from the study of particular concern is that nearly 30% of those aged 70 and 47% of those aged 85 are deficient in vitamin D. And the next study says the problems of vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency in older people. Thus, hypovitaminosis, hypo meaning insufficient or deficient, um, vitamin D is common worldwide, but is more common and more severe in older people. And for whatever reasons, I'm not sure of that, but I'm sure there are some researchers out there that could uh, elaborate on it. Um, elderly people uh, seem to not convert vitamin D3 as efficiently as we age. So maybe even more importantly, um, it is that uh, elderly people should be taking uh, vitamin D or getting vitamin D exposure through the sun. But if they're not converting well from the sun, vitamin D supplementation might be a very helpful or even important um, uh, thing to, uh, for optimal health. So again, I'm gonna to refer to Dr. Rell's uh, vitamin D and upper respiratory tract uh, presentation. He kind of summarized it nicely. African-Americans need about four to six times more sun-induced vitamin D. Those who are obese need two to five times more oral or sun-induced vitamin D. And uh, those with a BMI a body mass index of over 30. Elderly, will, uh, our patients are at risk for vitamin D deficiency. Um, and then he lists some other things, obviously infrequent sun exposure, since most of us are working indoors. Um, some estimates, and the estimates are all over the place, so please don't hold me to this, but about 30 minutes of sun exposure during midday, uh, about three times a week, um, means that we would have to be taking breaks from our workplace, going outside, getting down to our swim trunks and to get maximum exposure of our sun for 30 minutes of direct midday sun. That's just not reasonable for a lot of people who are working you know, five days a week during the weekdays. Again, those in the Northern latitudes, even if you are getting direct sun, you may not be getting D3 conversion, uh, even though you may get pinkness of the sun, you may get other things from the sun, uh, you may not be getting the D3 conversion. The best thing to do is to get your D3 levels checked, especially during the winter months or especially those who are in Northern uh, climates, for those who are African or Hispanic, and for those who are overweight 
or elderly. All of those should definitely look into, I shouldn't say should, uh, strike that, uh, might consider <laughs> getting your uh, levels checked and um, because it, it may um, be very important for your overall health. Um, those with recurrent respiratory tract infections, I'm going to touch on that as a consideration um, based on the medications that people are taking for respiratory tract infections and chronic sinusitis. So those are the ones that Dr. Rell uh, describes from his report. So this is the other consideration that I was talking to. This study <clears throat> showed, uh, and I'll read the study title to you, inhaled corticosteroid suppression of cathelicidin drives dysbiosis and bacterial infection in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is disease of the lungs. For those of you who have it, you know it. It's, it's not a fun thing to have. Um, and my heart goes out to you for those of you who had it, but please, um, you may consider, want to consider speaking with your physician, your practitioner, your doctor, um, because, and I'll quote directly from the study, ICS or inhaled corticosteroids impairs pulmonary clearance of bacteria through suppression of antimicrobial peptide cathelicidin. So, that may be a big concern of why people who already had um, uh, lung issues and may be taking an ICS may actually be putting themselves at greater risk for, um, for additional problems. Talk to your doctor about that. Uh, show the study to them. I'm sure they're aware of it uh, because if you go to the websites and read the counter interactions. It's listed there as well, uh, the contraindications and things like that. So um, do, do take that in consideration. Talk to your doctor about um, possible alternatives or how you can um, help, with, uh, help with this particular scenario or situation. So, all of the links are here. Um, you can see lots of different uh, um, studies um, that referring to these. Um, some of these are studies that are looking at the common cold or bacterial infections or other types of viruses, but also uh, for viruses that include coronaviruses, just to show you how cathelicidins are important in our immune system to uh, combat a whole a host of variety of different um, attacks on our body. This is our body doing amazing things, but just like everything in our body, um, and, and I'll, we'll post uh, all of these studies. I'm just going to go through them quickly because they're all the studies that I use quotes from or talked about, and uh, we'll uh, provide all those links in the bottom of the comment section so you can read them too as well. Um, but uh, with all of these, everything in our body uh, to perform correctly requires proper nutrition. If we don't input the nutrition, our body will eventually start breaking down in its processes and its ability to perform what it does. Our body is an amazing self-healing machine. And as long as we just give it what it needs to do its job well, to perform optimally, we can um, allow it to fight off and survive with some reports saying over 80 and up to 90% of the people um, not being severely affected or with any long lasting negative effects um, from the infection, you know, how are 90% of the people beating this when there is no vaccine, when there is no known uh, medical treatment? It's our body that's doing it. Now, how is our body doing it? I hope you understand through what I've uh, explained and show you through the research that um, some of the mechanisms of how our body takes care of this virus 
and viral infections, and why we're seeing more viral infections amongst Black people, amongst elderly people, amongst obese people, uh, uh, why they're more common during the winter months, why they're more common during people up in the north. Vitamin D3 is a common thread in all of those. Vitamin D3 deficiency is, and, and lower uh, amounts of vitamin D3, meaning lower amounts of capsaicin and, and lower ability to our body to defend against these um, attacking pathogens. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, some may say, hey, uh, you know, why are you your supplement company? Why are you talking about this? And I'm talking about this because I care about you. I want you to have information that may not be readily available to you. Uh, obviously, I, I get a little frustrated by the medical community not talking about some of this research. Um, they're hyper-focused on the drugs and the vaccine because they can make billions of dollars on vaccines. And yes, there's a place for them. Um, you know, and, and they may help uh, survival rates and stuff like that. I'm not saying anything against them. I'm saying that, that let's take a look at the things that are available right to us right now, immediately, that we could be using to help us nutritionally. Our body does incredible things. Our body is fighting to keep us alive all the time, but it can't do that well if it does not get the nutrition it needs in order to perform those functions. And that's where I think nutrition can play a big part. And look, people, people are dying. Uh, people are, are getting hurt. People are losing jobs. Our economy is trashed. And if there are small things that we can do that can help in any way, why shouldn't we be talking about these? Not just waiting for a vaccine that may be a year and a half away, you know, what can we do now that possibly may help? And, and even if it helps a little, even if it helps one person, isn't that important enough to be talking about? And I think that's where I really want to share this information so that you can talk about this with your physicians and uh, you know design an approach based on this information of how the steps that you may be able to take right now that may be able to help you or in, in the immediate future. Because look, every winter, you know, we may see another new round of a new virus strain or recurring viruses coming back again. And, you know, if we can use nutrition in any way, like D3 and butyrates, both which have been borne out in the research to have significant effects in helping people, why not talk about this? And that's where I come in. Uh, look, I'm not a research. I wasn't in, in college. I did a lot of reading of studies in college uh, in my field of biology. And I was fascinated by it, but I did not finish my degree. So I have no degree status behind me. Instead, I wanted to focus on nutrition, which is why I started a supplement company. And my passion is truly to help people improve their health through fitness and proper nutrition. And I hope you know, that is what is conveyed in, in this. Uh, I care about you. Uh, I want you to feel healthy. I want you to feel happy. And I want you to be alive <laughs> and enjoy life as much as possible. And I will continue to try to find what is available out there in nature to uh, offer to you that may have been beneficial to help. So in full disclosure, I don't sell vitamin D3 now. There are vegan vitamin D3s available out there. And um, uh, I will actually look into, um, well, I'll save that for another video. But we will always be trying to bring you good information that you can use for free and uh, all the links, all the studies, so you can validate themselves, discuss them with your physician, practitioner, healthcare person, and uh, talk them over. And if it makes sense to you, then use the information. If it doesn't make sense to you, then discard it, do what you want. That's good, because it's my gift to you. Uh, I am not saying it's right or wrong. Our science is constantly being updated every day. I'm excited about reading new research because every time I read new research, it's like, wow, that's what that means. 
And of course, it's not a final answer. Research is never a final answer because we always find more research that further elucidates what's going on in our body. Our body is an amazingly complex and uh, orchestrated uh, version of chemical actions that are going on. It's a brilliant system. And I think doing our part to put in our body the best nutrition uh, to allow our body to function at that high level, that's what I want for you. And that's why I do what I do. I hope you enjoyed this. If you like it, please give me uh, a like, share if you can. And, uh, and I, again, I will post all the research studies at the bottom of the links and answer your questions too as well. Um, thank you for watching and we'll have lots more every Thursday here at four o'clock. Thanks again. Have a great day. Be healthy. Be safe.